Because she does all the horrible things that I wish I could do to people. <laughs> Published on 30th of January, The House of Flame and Shadow by Sarah J. Mass, the third book in the Crescent City, has become the third fast-selling science fiction and fantasy title since the records began. Hi, I'm Sarah J. Mass. Come with me on release night for House of Flame and Shadow. Mass sold more than 44,000 copies of the new title in the week of its launch, which made her total worldwide sales for all her books to over 40 million copies across 38 languages. The Queen of Fairy Smart. I can't look most of my family in the eye now. <laughs> Sarah J. Maas is one of the most successful authors of today. She is a number one New York Times bestselling giant in fantasy with an estimated net worth of $40 million. Sarah was ranked the fifth most popular author on Goodreads between 2016 and 2021, and her books won in various Goodreads Choice Award categories a total of, I think, seven times. She has also been included in Forbes' esteemed 30 under 30 list in media category. But who cares about all those accolades when BookTok exists, right? And Sarah is arguably the most popular author on TikTok. Akatar hashtag alone has 1.2 million posts, encompassing everything from in-depth analysis of the books to Akatar themed workout programs. And throughout the years, Sarah has gained a massive audience. Her fans are super dedicated, oftentimes referred to as a cult. And nowadays, mass is pretty much unavoidable. Her novels have inspired tattoos, plenty of merchandise, and countless amounts of fan fiction. There have been babies named after her characters, and every time she holds any type of event, as we've seen, the response is quite overwhelming, and tickets get exhausted within hours of going on sale. That amount of success, of course, made Sarah and her books the subject of endless social media discourse, and I think it's fair to say that Sarah J. Maas is one of the most divisive authors out there. Those who love her books don't just love them, they are literally obsessed. And then there are critics who say that Sarah is Stephanie Meyer of her time, in that she wrote something that got wildly popular, despite it being not that great technically. So today we are going to explore both sides, and this video will have a pretty much similar structure to my Colin Hoover video, in that we are going to get to know the author, analyze the reasons behind her unprecedented success, and discuss the criticism and controversies that she was involved in throughout this year. And there is a lot to cover. I feel like I spent ages gathering all this information, so buckle up. Before we dive in though, I want to make a disclaimer that I try to stay fairly neutral in these types of videos, though I haven't done that good of a job in my Colin Hoover video, but maybe it will be easier for me this time around since I haven't read any of Sarah J. Maas books, so I'm neither swooned nor traumatized. But I'm trying to say that throughout this video I hope to keep an objective stance and to be here to first of all inform, to state the facts, and to express the opinion of general public of what people online think of Sarah J Maas. And you know, apart from these videos being just generally fun to research for and produce and hopefully watch too, I think they are also important in the sense that authors like Sarah J Maas are undeniable cultural phenomena. And being aware of the things of some of the practices the super popular authors are up to cannot hurt, basically. And discussions like this, where we maybe hold people accountable for what they put out into the world, are what I think drive the most progress and help make the change, maybe assist in getting rid of certain stereotypes, you get the picture. That being said, let's try to remember that people come from different backgrounds and care about different causes. Some people think that it's fair to hold writers, especially incredibly successful ones, to a much higher standard. Others think that Sarah, along with Colleen and many others, get criticized severely because people just dig and dig for things to be offended about. And you might want your authors to portray everything in a politically correct manner and, for example, to speak up about real-life political conflicts, and a person next to you might simply not want that. And it's highly unlikely that you're gonna change anyone's opinion by attacking and insulting them for their views on the internet. And this video is not my attempt to tell you who you should or should not read and support. I'm sure that you're perfectly capable of making that decision on your own. So let's just try and talk about our issues with Sarah J Maas and her books in an open and respectful discussion. 
today I have a special guest with me, and that is Sarah J. Mass. Sarah J. Mass is an American fantasy writer known for her fantasy series Throne of Glass, Court of Thorns and Roses, and Crescent City. Sarah is 38 years old. She was born in New York City to a Catholic mother and Jewish father, and she was raised Jewish. Sarah is happily married to her husband Josh. They have actually been together since her freshman year at college. They got married in 2010 and now have two children together. Sarah herself says Josh was always super supportive of her writing. I can write about true love because I get to live that every day and have someone that supports me and cheers for me yeah. and is just rooting for me and isn't threatened in any way by my success. How I'm sitting here today because my husband encouraged me and because when I need to to write and focus on things he says okay I'll pick up the slack with the kids like I'll handle bedtime tonight so you can focus on this and you don't feel guilty about that. Like so many authors Sarah found early inspiration in her reading. I just discovered fantasy books for the first time. I had loved fairy tales when I was younger and then I kind of like stopped reading a little bit around like seventh grade. I was like too cool for it. I had this amazing teacher in seventh grade who called my parents in for a conference and I was like look you know Sarah's not the worst student in our class she's not the best but she's not reading anymore and she should be reading and if she doesn't like the books that we're reading in class just take her to the bookstore let her wander around let her pick something out don't judge don't say anything just buy the books for her and so my parents did they brought me to the bookstore and I picked out three three fantasy novels I like walked out of the store with those and devoured them and it just woke something up in my brain and I not only loved reading them I realized I wanted to write those stories so I just kind of began writing very bad <laughs> attempts at writing fantasy novels. One of her first reading obsessions was Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling while one of her very early attempts at writing was Harry Potter Sailor Moon crossover fanfic. Apart from that, in multiple interviews, Sarah mentioned that two books in particular, so Sabriel by Garth Nix and The Hero and the Crown by Robin McKinley, where it truly began her love for reading fantasy and writing it. I must say that it really seems like for Sarah, it was truly clear from the very early on that she wanted to become a writer one day. Writing was just something that was constantly there and, you know, it's, I mean, now it's my full-time job, but this was kind of the only thing that I pursued with like the single-minded like to the point of obsessive you know force like this was this was it this was like I like I mean like my plan b was like there was no plan b like plan a was always publish a book plan b was if I couldn't publish a book then find some job where I could work and have enough time to write until I could publish a book. Right. Um, this, this was all I wanted to do, so I feel- Here's the story that Sarah told, that she took part in a creative writing workshop back when she was at Dalton High School. And when she submitted the first draft of her fantasy book that she had been working on, feedback from her teacher at the time wasn't positive at all. In fact, he spent an entire 45 minutes ranting about how fantasy fiction is not real fiction and it's basically completely meaningless. Still, this negative experience didn't stop Sarah but rather intensified her burning passion to prove that fantasy fiction could be as good as traditionalist fiction and could touch the readers in the same way. Writing is what brought me joy and writing in high school was a sanctuary for me like if things weren't going well at school with friends or you know at home with family I could turn to writing and that was my escape and my joy. Next, Sarah decided to pursue an academic career in this field and she studied creative writing as her major and religious studies as a minor at Hamilton College. Which, when you think of it, is quite a risky path to take in college. After all, creative writing degree is rarely used for what it's romanticized for, if that makes sense. When I was first getting started as a writer, like just trying to get my first book published, I told myself that even if it took me until I was 90 years old, that I just wanted one book published. It didn't take Sarah until 90 though. In fact, she published her first book, Throne of Glass, at 26. But interestingly enough, Sarah began drafting the first several chapters of the novel, Queen of Glass, which would later become Throne of Glass when she was just 16. The storyline of the Throne of Glass series is based on the story of Cinderella. The premise of what if Cinderella was not a servant, but an assassin? And what if she didn't attend the ball to meet the prince, but to kill him? 
him instead. Just like a lot of young authors at the time, she started posting drafts of her story on fictionpress.com and it quickly became one of the most popular stories on the website with close to 7,000 reviews. And the buzz that Sarah generated online was enough validation of her works and she went ahead and took her novel to traditionalist publishers and Soul Throne of Glass was purchased in March of 2010 by Bloomsbury. The book was published and very well received and so Sarah's career kickstarted. Eventually the entire Throne of Glass series ended up having eight books including a prequel collection. But what truly made Sarah this massive name that she is today was of course her second fantasy series A Court of Thorns and Roses or Akatar. A Court of Thorns and Roses, 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 A Court of Thorns and Roses. And just like Throne of Glass takes inspiration from Cinderella, Akatar is inspired by Beauty and the Beast, and it focuses on the story of humans and fae locked in an endless power struggle. It includes a lot a lot of steamy scenes. Well, I have already mentioned that Akatar is huge on TikTok and we knew for a while that it's going to be turning into a TV series for Hulu. Funny enough, Sarah's husband Josh was the one who accidentally leaked the news of a Hulu adaptation deal with an Instagram post of PB and J Sandwich. Visible in the pic was the edge of the script with the handwritten words Akatar TV adaptation notes. How truly accidental that leak was, we might never know, but since then, Sarah herself confirmed this information. This year, rumors started circulating that the show is getting cancelled, although both Disney and Hulu have yet to comment and confirm that. So the status of Akatar TV series are currently up in the air, though I personally don't understand what exactly is the problem here, because with the huge, well-established fan base that Akatar has, Hulu is pretty much guaranteed a super successful run of the series. Hi guys, editing me here. Since I filmed this video, I I've also seen these photos of Margot Robbie and Sarah J Mass question mark. I'm saying question mark because we cannot clearly see that it's her, right? Anyways, essentially rumors started circulating that Margot might be producing Akatar. But again, this is not confirmed whatsoever, just Sarah J Mass fans making assumptions. For we know Margot and Sarah could be besties having a lunch together, okay? But I just thought I'd leave it here. Okay, bye. I genuinely just woke up. I'm having my first coffee of the day. First thing I see when I log online, Sarah J. Mass and Margot Robbie met. Is, is Margot producing the show, the movie, whatever? I need to make something so clear right now. If Margot does this, a fan forever. I'm already on the front lines of Margot Robbie being incredible, but like if she produces Sarah J. Mass's work, you're never, I, ugh. I'm gonna cry. I keep thinking about it and I wanna burst into tears. And to finish this bibliography section, I wanted to also mention Sarah's third fantasy series, Crescent City, which is actually an urban fantasy. And the first book of the series, The House of Earth and Blood, was released by Bloomsbury in March of 2020 and was super well received and ranked one of the top 20 science fiction and fantasy books of 2020 on Kobo. And at the very beginning of this video, you saw that the series is still going strong and the release of the third book, House of Flame and Shadow was indeed a smash hit. And Sarah now does very little press. She mostly stays off of social media. Her entire Instagram page with 1.6 million followers is pretty much dedicated to promoting her books. And tell me, what is it with those best-selling authors? They all seem to struggle with an imposter syndrome. What do I say about myself? Um, I'm Sarah J. Mass. Please. <laughs> please, whatever. Um, and I have nothing interesting to say about myself whatsoever. <laughs> uh, One of the more surreal experiences for me in my publishing journey was being asked to blurb one of his books and like have my name on one of his books, which is like, I still to this day, I'm like, I like don't deserve <laughs> to be on one of his, it's like a weird thing, like that imposter syndrome, but also like, like, 12 year old me would be like screaming like to know like how this turned out and Sarah as well often mentions that the size of her readership shocks her to this day well if it is this shocking to Sarah herself it must be shocking to some of you watching this video as well so let's try and identify the reasons behind her books being this popular what is it that fans love so much about Sarah and her writing and how did she come to the level of success that she has now 
Firstly, I think what truly did it for her was the fact that she was one of the first authors, if not the first author, who started including smutty, overly explicit sexual scenes in her books, which were labeled young adult at the time. One of the most mortifying moments <laughs> of my career was my mother-in-law oh, no. pulled me aside. She goes, were all those steamy scenes inspired by you and Josh? I wanted to just walk into traffic. I was like, I don't. I was like, no, Linda, they were not. While this is also a huge point of criticism towards Sarah, you cannot deny that people in general love this type of content. They even actively seek for it, especially when you're a teen and this is all kind of in YouTube territory. Reading about spicy scenes between your favorite characters just hooks you in. And Sarah told that she herself was introduced to sex and sexuality through books. <laughs> My parents had no idea what I was reading. Like, And in general, this is one of her favorite aspects aspects of her writing. Second, and the most obvious reason, the rise of BookTok. Are you surprised? Nobody is surprised at this point. And though Sarah was already a pretty established author, TikTok helped her works to re-enter the mainstream with renewed force. And we've seen this trend with other authors as well. But just to give you a perspective of how hugely popular Sarah J Maas has become in recent years, according to this article, she has sold around 38 million copies worldwide. But out of those 38 million copies, 26 million sales have been made since 2022. And with the latest statistics, these numbers are actually 40 and 28 million respectively. In October of 2023, Sarah's publisher Bloomsbury announced that the sales of her work had increased by 79% in the first half of 2023, boost for the publishing house that's been described as Harry Potter effect. And here it's also worthy to mention the rise of romantic genre in general. If you didn't know, books within the genre blew up last year on TikTok and currently there is an undeniable demand for books similar to Sarah's. It is absolutely impacting sales and it is absolutely a phenomenon, says Rania Husseini, vice president of print at Indigo, who notes that out of the chain's top 20 fantasy authors, 25% fall under the romanticy umbrella. We are seeing a dramatic increase in unit sales for those authors, a 100% increase from the last year and significantly more than that to two or three years ago. As I mentioned in my romanticy video, the books within the genre are also a great starting point into a more complex fantasy and that's what makes them so appealing to a lot of readers. And there are indeed a lot of people who claim that they have gotten into fantasy via Akatar. Third, and the most important reason behind Sarah's overwhelming success is the fact that I personally think that she's a very smart woman, especially marketing-wise, and she's so successful not because or better put, not only because she's a great writer or a fantastic storyteller, but because she knows what sells and what her audience wants from her. Using this knowledge, she was able to create quite a strong sense of community. She's quite similar to Taylor Swift in that aspect for me. I mean, every Swiftie knows that being a Taylor Swift fan is not only about listening to her music or going to her concerts, it's the whole Taylor Swift lore, Easter eggs and connections and things like that. Sarah J Maas created a similar thing. She placed those tiny easter eggs throughout her books, slowly connecting her different series to each other and giving people something to constantly discuss and solve puzzles about. And for those of you who are in the middle of reading her books or are planning to, here comes spoiler alert. So if you don't want the books to be spoiled for you, just skip ahead. Timestamps will be in description down below. So people started comparing her books to the jaw-dropping crossovers of the Marvel movies after the cliffhanger ending of the book House of Sky and Breath from the Crescent City series when its heroine was essentially dropped into the Akatar world. And fans naturally freaked out. I'm not gonna lie, I myself am a sucker for this type of things, this interconnected universe of sorts. So you see how it only added to this excitement of being a Sarah J Maas fan. And Sarah herself said that one of her writer goals was to be like JK Rowling as she has always thought of her as the queen of foreshadowing. I could have made a very sarcastic comment right in this moment, but I promised to stay neutral, didn't I? I did. As soon as it, I like fell out of my chair, like I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, can I do that? And then I was like, yeah, like, I mean, like the, like, you know, like, isn't it like fun? Like when like, you know, the first Avengers movie wasn't like everyone's so amped to see like, you know, yeah. Iron Man and Captain America and like Thor, like all come together. And like, yeah. this kind of like feels like, 
that to me. Like I'm such a nerd, like thinking of my characters like that. Okay, apart from those three reasons, those who love Sarah J. Mass love her for her ability to write complex, morally gray characters who are never perfect and prone to making mistakes and therefore super relatable. Her tricky craft of dialogue and ability to create a unique voice for each of her characters and her world building gets praised quite a bit, although those are the very same things she's often criticized for depending on which side of the internet you will land on. And similar to my Colin Hoover video, I've seen a lot of people say that Sarah J. Mass reinvigorated their love for reading and a lot of people picked her books up during the pandemic and absolutely fell in love with the fantasy settings that she created. And last thing I'm gonna mention is that I've seen Sarah being overwhelmingly applauded and never criticized it seems like for representation of mental health in her books. People say that the way Sarah deals with trauma and the mental health issues that her heroines have to go through isn't something you often see in books, especially within fantasy genre. Like if you think of it, fantasy books are often quite intense and action-packed and the characters actually go through a ton of traumatic experiences. Like when you watch any kind of fantasy thing, like Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. for example, like when you go through an orc massacre, <laughs> You're going to have some trauma, right? I, I would be traumatized yes. if I survived the Battle of Helm's Deep. It rarely do authors dabble into PTSD and trauma that is left after. But Sarah does, and it also seems that this is all very personal to her. As she herself was struggling with intense anxiety and depression during the time that her first son was born. Sarah tells that she was going to therapy at the time, and she poured her mental health journey into a court of silver flames, specifically into the book protagonist, Nesta. I think her journey meant so much to me because um, like I've struggled with mental health like my you know for a good chunk of my my life but then especially in recent years um, and I had some pretty rough years recently that prompted me to start going into therapy and taking better care of myself but also learning more about myself and my like anxiety and depression um, and past traumas and all of that. Um, and so even though none of what Nesta goes through is a direct reflection of anything I went through, I was just able to channel a lot of those feelings and almost walk on that journey with her. Like when I started writing this book, I was kind of still emerging from this very dark and difficult place that I myself had fallen into. And I kind of went on the journey with her. Um, and so there's like this very deep connection that I have with, um, with Nesta and what she goes through. Okay, folks, now on to the juicy stuff, the things that Sarah J. Mass gets severely criticized for, the drama, the scandals, and controversies that she was involved in during her career as an author. And before we go into more serious stuff, let's start with some petty drama based on a lot of speculation. Apparently, there are rumors in the industry that Sarah is a mingo. Because she does all the horrible things that I wish I could do to people. <laughs> Let me explain to you where it all comes from. First, people noticed that Sarah J. Mass and Susan Denner, the author of Witchland series, who had a pretty public friendship, are no longer friends. When I say public friendship, I truly mean that they were constantly praising each other on social media, mentioning each other in their book's acknowledgments. And Susan once said that Sarah is the first person she tells anything. You can pause to read this love letter that Susan dedicated to Sarah. I am a better writer because of Sarah. Sarah. I am a better person because of Sarah. And oh wow, this just turned into a giant love letter to my best friend. But hey, it's a love letter truly deserved. Pretty intense, huh? But then they kind of went silent and people noticed that they are no longer following each other on social media and act weirdly in the presence of each other. Then Susan apparently talked about recognizing toxic people and having to stand up to a bully on her Twitter, again post read, and though no one knows if this was referring to Sarah or not, people just assumed at the time that there is a high chance that it was. And several other YA authors that Sarah used to be friends with, such as Lee Bardugo, Alexandra Brack, 
Meccan and Victoria Aviar are no longer in contact with her either. And on Reddit, there has been an anonymous comment about Sarah being super nice to her fans but being catty and possessive behind the scenes. Every couple years or so, she picks an unknown slash unpublished author to be BFFs with until they achieve a big level of success, which is when she starts getting jealous. She and Susan were friends for years and stayed friends until Susan became a New York Times bestseller, which was when Sarah started becoming really toxic because she doesn't like to share the spotlight. I mean, this is all obviously based on hearsay. We can neither confirm nor deny this information. This anonymous user could have just made this entire story up or it could only have been their own perspective of Sarah. So take this all with a grain of salt, of course. And now onto a more legitimate discussions. And the first thing we're gonna cover is plagiarism. Basically, a lot of people accuse Sarah of blatantly copying the plots, the storylines, and the quotes from other authors' books. From what I've seen, her books are getting compared to the Predane Chronicles and the Lord of the Rings, both of which Sarah herself admitted to openly loving. The most striking parallels and comparisons people draw are between Akatar and the Black Jewels trilogy by Anne Bishop. There are a lot of discussions online where people point out the similarities in the storylines and concepts in those two series. And what makes it especially infuriating for the fans of the Black Jewel series is the fact that Sarah J Maas gets so much praise and credit for the things that were allegedly the product of Bishop's writing and creativity. Apart from that, Sarah allegedly copied a lot of lines from other books as well. Some of the examples include Battle of the Stars, which comes from Treasure Planet, to Whatever End, which actually comes from Lord of the Rings, and a tweaked line from Harry Potter and reads from Akatar proclaims, light can be found even in the darkest of hells, which people say is oddly similar to Harry Potter's happiness can be found even in the darkest of times, if one only remembers to turn on the light. I find the last one to be a bit of a stretch. But I don't know, it's quite hard to understand like where is this line and when does the inspiration becomes plagiarism. But that's not the end of it. A lot of people also say that Sarah J Maas basically plagiarizes her own work in that she just recycles content from her other books. There are so many similarities in characters and plot lines between her own series that it gives you this feeling that you're reading the same old equation. To be fair, a lot of authors are guilty of it. Agatha Christie, used pretty much the same structure for her who done it and became what the best selling fiction author of all time and a lot of people actually find a lot of joy in getting into familiar stories and equations they like it when they know what to expect and books like this for a lot of people are their comfort reads then sarah's writing is getting criticized severely and being compared to a badly written fanfic people laugh at the fact that she seemingly has about 10 favorite words and phrases that she she uses constantly, growled, snarled, purred, reeking, eyes lined with silver, which apparently means crying, made an obscene gesture, velvet, steel, fire, and of course, mate. And you get sick of hearing those by the end of the first book in whatever series you've decided to pick up. I mean, a lot of contemporary writers are being dragged for their writing, but with Sarah, it is truly being taken to a whole another level, as a lot of people are pretty much convinced that Bloomsbury are no longer hiring editors for her books. For all critique is that her books are just too long and repetitive, that they could have been chopped about a third, if not more, to have a better, more cohesive story. There are cases of her using too many commas or not using questions mark at all. People basically think that because Sarah already makes Bloomsbury a ton of money and they know that her fans will buy pretty much anything that she releases, they don't necessarily bother with editing her books that thoroughly. Editing me again. One more thing I forgot to mention, that this issue as well is not something we've seen with Sarah only. A lot of authors have a tendency to basically ignore their editors as soon as they get super huge, which leads to their books deteriorating in quality and being overdrawn. Next, similar to a lot of YA books written by women, Sarah's books have been criticized for years and years for having too much romance in them. Readers complain about the romance overtaking the main plot, taking precedence over the actual story. A lot of people are not fans of the smart scenes either. Sarah's books, along with many similar, have been getting automatically dismissed as being frivolous, as being quote-unquote fairy porn, and not deserving the status of real fantasy. First on the page sex scene was in my Court of Thorns and Roses, the first novel yeah. in that series. And 
I needed a glass of wine just to like take the edge off. Felt like everyone was staring over my shoulder like watching as I wrote these like dirty words on I mean I get the joke about fairy smart and all but a lot of the times it also leaves a bad taste in my mouth as low-key reductive and misogynistic definitely don't see the same things happening to male fantasy authors who have sex scenes in their books male pen fantasy is actually full of rape tropes all kinds of sexual violence Big George Martin or Robert Jordan correct me if I'm wrong but but I haven't actually seen any sort of criticism for their explicit violent sex scenes. But because it is female joy and the spicy scenes are written through female gaze, there is suddenly a problem. Yeah, it just doesn't sit right with me. Like even the whole new ass term of romanticy was created to separate fantasy written by women from the rest of adult fantasy. The same way we apparently need to make a distinction that it's not just fiction, it's women's fiction. So God forbid a man accidentally approached this shelf at a local bookstore. And with this, I want to dabble into another super common critique of Sarah J. Mass works, incorrect labeling and marketing of her books. I mean, the term romanticy was only popularized last year. And before that, Sarah J. Mass's books were pushed out as young adults, even though they contained explicit sex scenes and a lot of violence. For a short period of time, book publishers experimented with a category titled New Adult that would create a home for the borderline books and that would be aimed at readers aged 19 to 25. But when the new adult marketing didn't stick, Akatar ended up back in YA genre, despite it containing a lot of steamy scenes. For all, many of Sarah's books are often grouped together in bookstores, making it easy for young readers to access content that they might not be prepared for. And you know, the more I read and learn about this whole marketing positioning tactics for books, the more conflicted I get about who precisely we should blame for this. For example, Sarah herself commented multiple times that she's surprised that her novels have been labeled in this way. Seeing that, I quote, there is a three-day sex marathon in one of her books. But despite that, she still agreed to publish Akatara's YA as long as her editor wouldn't censor any of the sexual content. And I found an interesting take on this whole topic in this article. What happened back in the olden times, so to speak, is that when you wrote this fast-paced, romantic, character-focused, plot-driven novels, especially as a woman, they forced you into the YA space. There were zero interest in the adult market because they wanted to publish the traditional epic fantasies like Game of Thrones. That's what they saw as adult fantasy. This meant that even if you had adult characters doing adult things, you might find yourself retooling your story for a younger audience in order to have it published by one of the big houses. Again, smells a bit like misogyny to me. And while I think we all surely agree that Akatar shouldn't be promoted to younger audience, I think we should also reconsider who we attack and criticize for these marketing choices. Like I'm not saying that Sarah J. Mass isn't responsible for how her books are being marketed, especially now that she's this huge name in the industry. But maybe we should direct a bit more criticism towards the publishers and the booksellers. After all, for how long the term romanticism will stick, how successful it will be in making sure that it's crystal clear that those books do skew a lot older is yet to be seen. Next massive points of criticism of Sarah J Mass books, which I kind of group together as they are connected in my mind at least, are misogyny, unrealistic portrayal of men, especially in smut scenes, and abuse apologism. So let's unpack one by one. Despite Sarah J Maas stating multiple times that she writes this strong, independent, badass women. I've always been drawn to writing women that can't be placed in any definable category. Yeah. You know, they can be very feminine, but then also go like beat the... <laughs> you know what, out of, <laughs> out of the bad guy and save the world and then look good to it. People find that there's actually nothing feminist about any of her characters, as they're oftentimes in romantic relationships with very controlling, overprotective, and stereotypically male partners that refuse to leave their presence and threaten to kill anyone who dares to breathe near their girl. Readers who criticize Sarah J. Maas for this say that if she only used her initials and they didn't know she was a woman, they'd actually think she was a dude, as she writes women like men. And write women. And again, a 
apparently her descriptions of men, especially in smart scenes, aren't great either. All of the males in her books are super muscular, powerful, animalistic, boring, hypersexual, and super dominant with massive male parts. Many argued that they are just paper thin and only exist to be objectified by women. And her dramatic, earth-shattering descriptions of sexual intercourse not depict the experience of sex realistically either. And while yes, her books are within fantasy genre and they have never been marketed as being a realistic fiction, this over-the-top unrealistic sex scenario still definitely has have an impact on younger readers who, as we established, do have an access to these books. And for many of those young readers, Sarah J. Mass's books might be their first introduction to sex and sexuality through literature, so there is that to consider. And when it comes to abuse apologism, let's just go ahead and rename this section to an alleged feminist King Chrysanne from Akatar being abusive to the love of his life for the entirety of the series. Massive Akatar spoilers ahead, so again, skip ahead if you need to. So if you're not familiar with Akatar at all, it follows our main female lead fairy, a human who then also becomes a fairy, and her two love interests, Tamlin and Rissan. And while everyone seems to be absolutely hating Tamlin for being abusive, which is fair enough, I'm not disputing that, Rissan gets overwhelmingly praised and simped over online. But just for the fancies, let's count together just a couple of fucked up things that he does over the course of this series. So on one occasion, Rissand licks the tears from Fairy's face while she's having a breakdown and then mocks her for having a physical reaction to that. And I know what you're thinking, we could have just stopped at the phrase licks the tears, but no, it actually gets worse. It, get, it got worse, yeah. but I feel like it's about to get worse off. It got worse though. It got worse though. On another occasion, he breaks Fairy's already broken arm to get her to make a deal with him. A deal being that he would heal her arm in exchange for her agreeing to come to his court and belong to him for a week every month. If that wasn't enough, he then has a loud sex with Fairy in a library meant to be a safe space for the victims of sexual assault, and you in a library where everyone could hear them and relieve their trauma. And overall, he constantly acts possessive and goes into rages over Fairy, denies her choice and autonomy, makes decisions about her body and her life while she's pregnant. And this so-called pregnancy trope is a huge massive point of criticism towards the series and Sarah J Maas herself. Long story short, in a court of silver flames, Fairy is pregnant with a baby that has wings and her hips are essentially not the right shape to allow the baby to pass through without damaging them both severely. Rissant and almost all of his friends know that this is basically guaranteed to kill her, but he forbids anyone to tell her about it. When Fairy does finally find out, it is already too late to do anything about it and more than that, her sister Nesta is painted as villain for telling her. It all ends up with Nesta, the strong female character, having to give up her powers for the sake of her sister and her nephew. I think we all agree that this storyline is problematic in itself. It's a clear representation of reproductive abuse, when one person controls the reproductive choices of another person. And I think right now, in the current state of America, where a woman's choice for pregnancy is being restricted quite heavily, this just, you know, doesn't send the best message out there. Another classic piece of criticism, which usually has people divided into two camps, the lack of diversity. So first, Sarah was criticized for all of her characters being white, attractive, able-bodied straight people, which, okay, I get that some people absolutely roll their eyes at this piece of criticism, other things that representation is important, to each their own. And it looks like Sarah has seen this criticism, assured that she is open to learn from her mistakes and try to do something about it. But the thing is, many believe that Sarah did a terrible job at fixing what was wrong by adding token diverse characters. Her queer characters especially are artificial and very poorly done. She, for instance, told the readers that the character was bisexual by explaining that they like threesomes, which is stereotype for bisexuality. Another case is when Sarah J. Mast killed off Nehemia in The Crown of Midnight, the second novel in the Throne of Glass series, which not only Nehemia was the only black character in the series, she was actually killed off to basically motivate the white protagonist to fight. On top 
top of that, people pointed out that Sarah provides quite vague descriptions for some of the characters, which can result in people giving her credit for being diverse and having representation, even though she didn't actually put the time and the effort to research and write about marginalized groups with proper care. I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You either get a representation from someone without the lived experience of the community, or you get no representation at all. Rarely do we see great examples of white authors writing diverse characters. I have a pretty neutral stance on this, but what I must say, it pisses me off when a writer, for example, does something problematic to a marginalized community, and they in turn point it out, and instead of at the very least staying silent and recognizing that this is not the time and place to speak up about the issues that do not concern you directly, a lot of the fans in an attempt to stand up for their favorite author turn to those marginalized communities and gaslight the ever-living shit out of them. Yeah, let's just not do that. Okay, next up, to this day, it seems like everyone's biggest issue with Sarah personally is the Instagram post she made in September of 2020, after which she was accused of using the murder of Breonna Taylor to promote the cover of A Court of Silver Flame. Again, you can pause to read everything that she wrote. Mind you, to this day, Sarah hasn't taken the post down or even edited it, despite a lot of people in the comment section saying that, you know, this is kind of tone deaf and really fucked up. Here again, there were two camps of people, a community of black people who were heard to see Sarah use a movement meant to discuss the violent ways black people are murdered at the hands of the police to promote herself and her books. And there were some that were essentially arguing that Sarah was using her large social media platform to spread awareness, that she's so huge that she certainly doesn't need current events to promote her works, and that her posts are already being followed by her fans who just want her book updates. So yeah, while for some this caption reads like, this was really awful, but look at my new book. For others, it reads like, here's my new book, but now that I have your attention, you need to care about this other thing that is much more important. Regardless of what her true intentions were, this post just fell flat for a lot of people, and to this day it is brought up as a massive criticism towards Sarah J. Mass. Now let's address the elephant in the room, shall we? If you're not aware, Sarah J. Mass constantly gets referred to as Zionist. And first, I want to provide you with just straight facts that I was able to gather on this topic. So in 2015, an article in the Jewish Chronicles was published that was about Sarah J. Mass participating in birthright trip, saying that Israel was a magical place, talking about her grandmother who served and still volunteers for the Israeli military, and just saying, you know, overall positive things about Israel. And right off the bat, people were pissed that she talked about the birthright trip as another privileged American who gets a chance to visit these places, while Palestinians are not able to do the same because an opportunity to go to their home was essentially stripped from them, right? And to my knowledge, she never talked about Israel after that interview in 2015. But this article resurfaced a couple of times, first because of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza in 2021, and then of course in 2023. So the Zionist claims arose because she never publicly denounced Israel's actions, she never once made any sort of statement condemning Israel committing a literal genocide in Gaza. Yes, we don't know anything about her current beliefs. All we have is what she shared in that 2015 article. And it has been, what, nine years since 2015? And I certainly believe that people can evolve and change their opinions and their thoughts and educate themselves on certain topics within that amount of time. So it's not a given that she currently supports Israeli government and their actions. Like, we cannot state that as an undeniable fact. But I think as much as her staying silent has given her the benefit of the doubt. It has also done the opposite. It allowed people to make assumptions and decide the narrative and eventually throw the Zionist claims around. If she has changed her views, she has given nothing to her fans to go off to make that assumption. The fact that she hasn't said anything about recent events just doesn't sit right with a lot of people and a lot of readers, especially Palestinian readers, are at the very least disappointed at her indifference. Here again, some say that people in the public sphere do not have an obligation to advocate for every issue and since Sarah herself comes from a Jewish family, it must be hard for her to speak up. Others say that no, 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 especially if you come from the country that is the perpetrator, have to speak about the atrocities that are going on 
and especially if you supposedly used your platform previously to attract attention to Brianna Taylor, why can't you just do the same right now? With this topic, there are a lot of questions and not a lot of answers to them. And again, this silence and essentially bystander behavior just makes people rethink whether or not they want to support Sarah J Mass or not. There are two more things that I want to discuss. First about Sarah J Mass coming out with a ton of special editions of her books with different bonus chapters and essentially profiting off of her fans. This creator actually made a wonderful in-depth video addressing this issue so if you want you can go and watch it for more details. But in a nutshell in July of 2023 Sarah J Mass, together with Bloomsbury announced that they will be selling special editions of her newest book House of Flame and Shadow and that they will be five additional bonus chapters that are spread across five different books. So if you are a diehard fan of this series and you want to know more about those characters and the world itself, you essentially have to go and buy all five of them, which is what, 120 bucks at least? I mean, yeah, technically you don't have to go and buy all five of them. No one is forcing your hand. But I think the publishers are well aware of how dedicated Sarah J Maas fans are and how there is this pressure in the bookish community, especially in fandoms, to own the special editions, to read every additional chapter that the writer releases. So they essentially decided to turn it into a cash grab. This is again oddly reminiscent to me to what Taylor Swift does with 100 different versions of the same vinyl, each vinyl containing a different bonus song, and there's never one vinyl that has all of the songs on it. And while decisions like this are certainly made by the marketing department of the publishing house, the author, Sarah in this case, has to be complacent because she's the one writing all these bonus chapters and benefiting from it as well. And again, she's just so huge at this point that she could have easily just said no and walked away from the deal. She's not just a new author on the horizon with no bargaining power at all. So I think both the publisher and Sarah herself are at fault here. It's definitely important not to give into this marketing strategy as if it is successful, it will eventually become the norm, which is not necessarily fun. And finally, we have been here for ages, I swear to God. Our last point of discussion is that in spring of 2023, controversy sparked surrounding House of Earth and Blood and its cover apparently generated by AI. Essentially, readers noticed that the back of the UK edition of Sarah's House of Earth and Blood credits Adopt Stock for the illustration of Wolf on its cover. And the illustration matches an image created by user Aperture Vintage and is marked as AI generated on Adobe's website. And the issue with this is that AI image generators and databases uses the existing artwork without the creator's permission. And artists and illustrators have been asking for a while for safeguards to be put in place to ensure that creative businesses will continue to exist and thrive. And Bloomsbury is one of the biggest publishing houses out there. If anyone can afford to hire real illustrators, instead of just purchasing Adobe stock, it's them. So you can imagine how pissed people were and I mean rightfully so. If anything, this just seems super lazy to me. Bloomsbury since has said that they were unaware an image they used on the cover was generated by artificial intelligence. As part of this process, we incorporated an image from a photo library that we were unaware was AI when we licensed it. The final cover was fully designed by our in-house team. Final cover as in they added a couple of leaves and a bunch of text on it. And once again, while Sarah had probably truly zero involvement in this process and she I believe had no idea and couldn't care less where that image came from. She didn't shy away from praising and promoting this stunning cover on her Instagram page. And that was everything I wanted to share with you regarding Sarah J Maas and her books. While it may seem as a lot of critique, when you check the actual statistics and see how many copies of her books have been sold and continue to sell, you see that there are certainly not that many people participating in Sarah J Maas discourse or caring about the criticism directed at her. And Sarah is in the process of writing her next books already. In an interview with Today, she explained that she has already planned out her next four books, I believe. So is there more coming from this series? Yes. <laughs> I can't tell you when. But we'll have but to wait. Yes, yes. And you will have to wait a bit, but it's you know, on the airport taxiing line. It's a little down. But I kind of know the vague ideas of what I want to happen. I haven't even told my editor this. Surprise! <laughs> the next four 
books that I want to write. And so they're kind of like in like this taxiing position. Do you have something written down anywhere or no? I have like little notes scribbled in notebooks, yeah. but it's mostly all just kept in my head. I have a terrible memory, <laughs> but my books, I just have this like encyclopedia in my head where I just keep track of it. And maybe it's because the worlds and characters feel so real to me. For the upcoming books, I kind of know, you know the, next, the next one I'm supposed to be writing right now. That one I, I know much more about. Is that part of the series? So that's going to be the next Court of Thorns and Roses okay. book. I'm very, very excited about that one. So whether you like it or not, we are going to continue to hear from her in the next couple of years. And if Akatar TV series does end up seeing the light of a day, Sarah will expand her fan base even more and reach new audiences who may not have discovered her books yet. So yeah. Let me know what you think about Sarah J Maas or if you have anything to add regarding the topics that we discussed today. Whether you're a fan or a hater, I would love to hear from you in the comment section down below. And if you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel to never miss an upload from me. And stay safe and I'll see you in my next one. Bye bye!